So here we are, the final part of the open world vanilla exploration series. Today we're going to be getting 100% map completion on the Cursed Shore, which will also give us 100% map completion across the whole world. That will give us a gift of exploration. We can use, actually, actually give us two of them, which we can use in legendary crafting and a star next to our name. That signifies, you know, we've done a really, really big thing here. To be honest, I'm kind of blind to the star nowadays. I don't really look at it because the proportion of players that have one is obviously much higher now that everyone's had eight years to grab one. So it kind of became a bit meaningless in more recent years. I've always been a fan of the idea that as they added new maps, like with the Living World seasons and expansions, the star goes away until you map complete those post-release ones too. That would have been really nice, but uh, really, this is all you need to do, and uh, this playlist covers it all, so we could call this a playlist about getting your star. In any case, uh, there's lots to talk about here at the Cursed Shore. As with the other two Orion maps, it doesn't really overlap very much with Guild Wars 1, since this was not explorable region, but I will say this is not the most remote map in the game. That title, pro as far as Guild Wars 1 locations are concerned, that title probably goes to Malkor's Leap. See, funnily enough, we are pretty close to a Guild Wars 1 area right now. Can you guys guess it? It's the Fire Island chain, which is really not too far across. In fact, if the devs had added another map just to the east out near the waters of Or, they very much could have allowed you to swim straight to the Fire Island chain based on the scale that this game is, is set at, which is kind of funny. Opening up here, really nice big outpost, tons to do. POI, Waypoint, Skill Challenge, and a Vista. That's all four of them. That is every single objective. There's no Renown Hearts here, obviously, so I, I like to imagine that they would have put a Renown Heart here if that had actually been an ambition for. And so we kind of get a four in one. I'm not, I talked in a previous episode of the playlist that I think that's generally a bad idea, and I still stand by that. But at least on this, you know, the Hero Challenge is a combat challenge. And this is a well-trafficked location, so maybe people could help you out with it. So it's it's a separate experience to get in the POI. The waypoint is obviously useful. It's just a prominent waypoint at the start of the map. And this vista, yes, is in the same location. But, I mean, look at this big jumping puzzle we've got to do. When you're not gliding or doing mounts, it takes a lot of work. This is, again, my favorite kind of vista, honestly, where you end up exploring a whole area you wouldn't have otherwise. I guess we're on a giant, like, shell and coral that had sprouted up in the period of time when ore was underwater. And uh, we're in a magical fantasy world, so we don't have to question how gigantic this all is. Kershaw has got a really interesting aesthetic for the underwater stuff. As I mentioned in a previous part, I personally wish that the devs had more time for ore. I've actually always been a fan of the idea that Guild Wars 2 at launch never added any maps past Timberline. So the Steam Spur Mountain range and the Orion range, plus all of those storylines. Basically, the personal story, I think, should have been tapered off at, after Claw Island and the establishment of the patch. Packed. All of that could have been what Season 1 was. They could have been post-release updates that expanded the game world and kept everyone unified and excited about this idea of fighting the dragon. Everyone would have followed the story. There wouldn't have been like a weird jump in the kind of characters we're dealing with or why we're dealing with them. It would have flowed really well and it would have given the devs tons of time to do places like Ore and the Steam Spur Mountains really well. And I, I think they had their successes with this environment, certainly. They just could have done it a lot better, especially when you break out of these maps. Now, I have a lot of memories of breaking out of the Orion maps because they were so easy to escape from. And when you break out, you really can just see how very hastily cobbled together these environments were. And they just kind of throw all these watery things everywhere. Kershaw's at least got the golden thing going on for it. This actually has one of my favorite day-night cycles in the whole game. It looks very, very different based on the time of day. And it's generally a beautiful place with this like weird, eerie, golden light. Makes you think of what all once upon a time was as we get to the very end here. Here's this archway that's fallen down, by the way, I mentioned in the last part of this playlist. A big tip for you guys as well, if you really want to enjoy what this map looks like, turn the in-game bloom setting off because you'll get a lot more detail out of the sky. And it really, it will drown you out a little bit less. It will be a very, very nice color. Often with reshade demonstrations, I love coming here both in the day and the night. So, back behind us a little bit, we were just covering quite a large area of the map where lots of events can trigger. So, I'm, I think most launch players will have very distinct memories of that section of the map. Why? Because doing those events, which cycled very, very quickly, was an excellent way of getting tier 6 mats, sometimes getting exotic weapons, rare weapons to salvage into ectoplasm, 
and Karma. Karma from doing these high level events that rotated very quickly. And one of the event chains specifically that was flowing there was the Plinks chain. So that became known as the Plinks farm and was extremely popular. When I first started playing this game, my server was Emery Bay. And I remember some of the first guys to ever get legendaries on our server. I don't know how that lines up with where everyone game wide got their legendaries. But those first few legendaries were from people who were farming the Plinks chain. And if you ever wanted to see a legendary in those earliest days, all you needed to do was go up there. Because you found like these, and I've never really understood it, but people who just really, all they care about is the reward to the degree they will subject themselves to this boring, inane, insane process of just looping that event over and over and over again. And that's what they did. It was a farm for a long time. I wish I, and by the way, this little room that we're in here is awesome. I wish I could say I have a ton, ton of fond memories and nostalgia, but I don't. I think there's a few things going on. First of all, any memories I do have of having done Plinks, and I did do a bit of it, uh, are kind of drowned out by later memories. You know, I don't have nostalgia because I still spend so much time on this map, really, uh, for various reasons. Like this labyrinth, I love this. This is such a cool, weird place with environmental objects you can sort of uh, interact with. It's a nice way for ArenaNet to get you to stick about in an area without actually having a heart here. And I remember I did a video here once showing off blood magic and some of the underpowered weird parts of Necromancer early game. I've done videos showing consumables, broken consumables that you can get here. I've done so many different things on this map that I don't have much nostalgia for that. The other reason is I just didn't do plinks that much because I had another farm, a much more secretive and interesting farm that also took place on this same map. But was not at the very north, it was at the very south. And I'll talk more about that, I guess, when we get there. But so yeah, Plinks was not such a big thing for me. And even if I didn't have that other farm, I just, I don't know whether I would have subjected myself to that. It was, MMO launches, and this has not changed, okay? We're talking about 2012, a long time ago now. Mindsets have not changed at all. There's something very weird about MMO launches in like this just insane rush people subject themselves to like desperate to hit 80 as fast as possible or whatever level cap is for that game and find the most efficient farm instantly and just i i don't understand it personally i i, I sort of respect my moment to moment enjoyment of the experience a little bit more than the, the grind that people go into and it's weird because guild wars as a franchise and as a guild wars one player i felt like really attracted a lot of people who felt like me and were very resistant to that kind of grind but the truth is, as soon as Guild Wars 2 came out, I don't know whether it's because they broadened their horizons, the kind of people that they attracted. It felt like, you know, we were in a very classic MMO landscape with people doing that. One of the dungeons as well, COF, people just incessantly farming the same path. People, I think, hate forced grind, but don't mind at all subjecting themselves to it if they feel it's a choice, you know? It's their choice to come to do plinks all the time. So now they'll happily do it like a little workaround or something. And same with the dungeon. I don't know, it's just it's a weird mentality shift that I, I never really had too much of. The farm I was doing, I really enjoyed because it wasn't that grindy. And also you could do very little amounts of it for quite a lot of money and reward. <laughs> Which we'll get to soon. Anyway, so we're in now as a part of one long meta event. Well, actually multiple meta events that chain into each other. That take you from the north of the map all the way down to the gates of Arar. Where hopefully around there we'll end up getting our map completion. This is a map, again, I really regret, it's a bit like the Straits of Devastation thing, that a lot of people don't experience the metas. The metas here are great. They really scale up very heavily with the amount of Orient to attack. The point is, you do an escort, you find a location in ore, you decide that you're gonna fortify it, so you clear all the Risen out, that's an event. Then you probably gotta defend it a little bit, that, uh, as the Risen try to take it back. If it's well defended, more escorts trigger. You go down the road further. There's another outpost. And you do, like, dynamically kind of spread across the map taking territory. This one in particular at launch was brutally difficult. Very, very dangerous scaling here. Joe Fasts. My god. I have so many memories of working on Joe Fasts here and failing. And, you know, and if at any point the dynamic event chain broke because people never managed to defend or did an escort, suddenly the whole thing's a bit wobbly. Maybe you end up securing Jofas, but the other three outposts behind you, shelters and penitent and stuff, they've all fallen to the Risen. So now it's suddenly really important that you don't mess up because there's no way back, you know. Uh, that kind of stuff is what dynamic events could have and should have been really good for. But again, combat balance and stuff like that meant it generally it, it boiled down into quite a binary experience. 
Here we're actually in range of a temple. This is probably my least favorite temple. Very little going on here. There's just an escort. Um, we have a, a swap from day to night there. That's kind of nice. Uh, it's just an escort to get here. This is Melandru. Melandru, I think, is a really important god, particularly for the story of Or and the corrupted landscape and all that kind of stuff. But it just doesn't come to the bar of quality that Lissa does in terms of its mechanics or Dwayna does in terms of its story or Balthazar did in terms of its rewards. Uh, and Grenth later as well at the very last temple we see is the Grenth one in terms of his ambience So, you know, that's just kind of plopped in a field It does at least have a cool bit of story where it is located up Upon the artesian waters and the very end of the personal story ends like right near there So, you know, that's a nice moment I guess and that's a little bit of value for the the Melandra event But I really don't have many positive or great memories from that so, in fact, it looks like we're heading towards Grenth now, actually. Uh, these waterways, I remember exploring a lot for a long time, specifically because, again, it's a bit like I was saying in the Frost Gorge episode. Now that we're in true level 80 content, there was Orichalcum to be had here. Actual mining to do every day at reset. And even the Mithril and stuff, so to speak, as well, was well worth it. I love this as well. It's so eerie and purple and creepy down here. They do the double up thing, though, again. They've got a hero, a hero challenge and a POI together. I really, when you're not even doing renown hearts, you gotta, you gotta spread that stuff out. I think, you know, to make these a little bit longer. I kind of regret that these last few episodes are a bit shorter on the runtime. One thing I actually really wanted for this series, since it's the end, I, you guys might find it interesting. I originally wanted to produce this in such a way there was no footage speed up whatsoever. And the idea was that by the end, if someone sat down and watched it all, you would know in your own mind, wow, if I'd just been playing Guild Wars 2, doing what I saw on screen as I sat here in bed watching this video, whatever. I don't know what you guys' routine is as you watch these. But you could know, ah, oh, if I'd just been in game, I would have map complete right now and I would have two gifts of expression. I really liked that idea, but the problem was that in some of these maps, they're really wonkily paced in terms of, you know, a really interesting heart with a ton of things to say has like very weird scaling so you're done with it instantly and then other times there's really boring hearts that take way too long and um, it just kind of didn't work so these have all been sped up by about 20 percent there are two episodes near the end that were sped up more because of footage issues and stuff but it also means that some of these orient episodes end up uh, a little bit short you know around in the 20 minute ballpark some of the early ones were out in 40. so this whole area now this is kind of my big nostalgia bomb i don't come here too often anymore but this is where i used to farm so this is the Temple of Grenth. First of all, has amazing point of interest names and region names. The Altar of Murdered Dreams and all that kind of stuff. There's so much poetry and, you know, high fantasy, crazy kind of weird uh, ideals going on. Even if they're not necessarily reflected in the, the, the landscape itself. There's a really weird mini airship that's here. The meta event for Grenth is actually really layered. There's all It's kind of a mix of a temple assault and also like the other meta events where you're capturing locations. Like there's a whole thing where you need to take down Orion anti-air and then you need to set up your own cannon there and these are locations that can be flipped. And then finally you get the Order of Whispers coming on in uh, to this room which does overlap with some really amazing personal story stuff right at the end of the game. But the idea of this and how my farm worked related to these ice elementals here. It's actually amazing that we've got to see some of these temples being active on this video here. That's nice. So here's the idea. These ice elementals spawn during one of the phases of this boss. The fight itself has got all this weird mechanics where you take massive damage unless you commune with the mist and like step into a portal and become half in the mist and half out of the mist. There's all kinds of weird cool things here. Uh, and he's got these these massive ice spike attacks that come down. But specifically, he would spawn all of these ice elementals. And they were very squishy, but they were level 80 elementals. And they were an infinite supply of them. As long as you could stall the event in the perfect way that you didn't kill the boss and you didn't die to him, but you did stay in combat and keep him a little bit weak. And in this way, you could avoid fighting him and use like a thief with a short bow, bouncing auto attack, to cleave through these elementals. They would drop corrupted lodestones, which is like the icy form of lodestone. And that was really good for all kinds of legendary crafting and Mystic Forge recipes. And when I used to farm this, they were worth like a gold and a half each, sometimes up to two gold. And no one really knew how to do it. What would often happen is if other players came along, they'd start fighting the boss. And if they managed to kill him, 
Killing the boss there doesn't actually flip the temple. Killing the boss triggers one final defense event. Just another interesting thing about the Grenth Temple. And so then you could, like, abandon the guy and let the, the, the temple flip. So this all is kind of shady and weird. And the idea of the open world is that you should never be trying to get events to fail. And that's what that farm actually uh, relied on. Eventually, the devs did nerf it. I think rightly so. But at the time, I was kind of kind of getting to grips with what my, like, ethics were with the game. And what I thought was moral with the game and all that kind of stuff. And I, and I never saw any problem with... You know, if there's just one guy around and no one else was in that temple doing that or with any kind of regularity, um, you just kind of let people fend for themselves. And then worst case scenario, you could actually pick up the skulls in the area and the environmental objects and you could use them to fear Joe Fast himself, who is a mission critical NPC. You could use the skulls to fear the NPC over to the uh, corrupted priest of Grenth. And then the priest would kill Joe Fast. The whole thing would fail. You'd get kicked back out to like the airship and then you would push back in after that and that was obviously always a bit of a slowdown for the farm but uh it was a really good uh way of getting money and what i did was i took the money i earned from that invested into the first halloween items like the ghostly grinning shield and the chain greatsaw uh held on to those for like half a year sold them for crazy amounts of money and that's how i funded my first legendary it was all through that, through farming this this event here. So yeah, I got loads of memories and weird specific mechanical information about that one temple. Down here in these southern waters, again, it's so cool here. This is like the the Mausolus Sea, and there's an area related to, to Desmina as well. It's all just referring to the gods. You saw we were in a really weird remote region. That was a one of the two jumping puzzles in this map. Kind of the obvious easier one. Actually, I think that jumping puzzle is technically an explorer achievement. The other one is to do with 12 orbs, which is hidden in one of the walls. This area was very common as well. Uh, this was a good place for a while to get uh, those dynamic event dailies done. You could come here for these. And at the same time, this was an especially good place for Orichalcum. There's like a little route through the rocks here that is used in some personal story. Is even used in some Silvari Caladon Forest personal story, believe it or not. But running through here and grabbing the Orichalcum, I have many, many memories of. I used to I used to go Frost Gorge, then here, then into the Obsidian Sanctum in World vs. World. And I kind of miss that, you know? I, I kind of miss gathering runs. Which is another element of the game that I think has been de-emphasized at this point. So here we get another one of these big arcs. You're probably familiar with the layout of these at this point, particularly through the personal story and the numerous times you've had to explore them. But ArenaNet tried to keep it interesting. Sometimes different doors and hatches are open. Sometimes it's underwater. Sometimes there's coral blocking your way. Different events and things going on. There's actually a good dynamic event for uh, materials here as well, where you need to, I believe it's you run over to bodies, interact with them, they explode. And there's like loads of risen grubs come out, which you can cleave down, but there's loads of them. So you go over there and you tag those, and that was a nice thing. I think I used to intermittently do that with the penitent farm. It's funny to see penitent empty, because in, in some ways, you know, life moves on and the game changes, and you just don't realize it has until suddenly you're back in the cursed shore and you see no one's at penitent. But nobody's been farming pen penitent for a very, very, very long time now. In fact, I think a lot of it was wiling away even before the champion bag update. It wasn't even for champ bags. People probably think of it as that, but it's not. Speaking of the champ bag update, another crazy farm I participated in on this map. Right when the champ bag release came out, most people were in all kinds of weird areas. I was here where we would cap maps out with 150 people. And the main meta event to open the gates of Ara, okay... Uh, has we would stall that I say we I was never in charge of these maps I would just be in the zerg but one of the specific events right before the gates of Ar Ar has you come into a building that's just behind us right now and uh, the pack wants to set up an outpost there but before they can do that they've got to kill all these risen and there's these flaming cauldrons on the roof of a great glass dome and as the cauldrons like seed you down below a bit world versus world style burning oil style all these fire elementals are spawning and if you scaled that event up these fire elementals would be in ludicrous abundance they were all champions so you could and, and here's the thing that farm the champ bag farm against those fire elementals it wasn't that anyone was deliberately failing it in as much as it was so hard there were so many fire elementals and they were all so deadly with so much aoe capability and stuff it was almost impossible to actually legitimately beat the event. So I think that that farm just kind of naturally happened where 
big zergs ended up here in ore. And like, now it was okay that it stalled because it was a ludicrous farm anyway. So there was never any incentive for the zerg to dissipate because realistically they wanted the champ bags. So that was the craziest stuff to me. That was like when Lion's Arch got attacked by the Karka and there was all the network latency and all the Karka were culled out and stuff. It was exactly like that again, but here in Ore, and you kind of wanted to be there. Maybe the network latency wasn't so bad, but it was completely nuts. You just get one shot by these ridiculously dangerous things that you can even see all along this road is the this precise area where the event would be. It was nuts. Even recently in the personal story LP where I redid this, some of us struggled here. Uh, it's all been nerfed and fixed up and refined now. In some ways, the champ bag update was very good for creating sort of forcing arena net to fix all these weird wonkily scaling bits in the game. They, they admittedly haven't got all of them, but a good deal of the outliers, they certainly did. And I remember it was so hard as well. these enemies would scale up to having tons and tons and tons of health, right? And you only get a tag in this game. Guild Wars 2 is a game that just tries to give you a tag all the time. But a weird thing happened. If you have 150 people hitting the, t the target and its health is scaled to be 150 times its normal health, you may only do a fraction of 1% of his overall health. You might throw everything you can at it, especially like closer to launch where you're not that good at the game or whatever, and you don't qualify for loot. And here's a funny thing. Everyone can be in that position. So you, you, this was a real experience. You would have 150 people kill a champion and no one gets loot from the champion because no one particular person was able to do more than like a full percent or a full percent or a half and a half or whatever the threshold was. So you did have weird like toxic things going on there as well where it became an, a DPS arms race, but everyone knows it's a DPS arms race. So suddenly, um, and, and also there was a more intriguing balance there in terms of like how much AOE you wanted to hit and stuff like that. Uh, so it was kind of an arms race and you kind of wanted people to not be good so that you could do a higher proportion than them And it's chaos, you know it, You guys are probably thinking of this as a very raiding mindset And you're probably sitting there with all the information and understanding a full community is built over eight years th Thinking snobbly, oh I bet I could have tagged it Trust me, it was very very difficult to tag stuff More than anything just because the events were pure chaos You can hardly even see where things spawned um, I can't remember the order of when the culling update came in. Was that before or after champ bags? I can't remember that. Anyway, I did a lot of that and it was such a crazy time and I don't think I ever made a video of it. Uh, I don't think it ever appeared in the background of Q&A or anything. Maybe it did. Maybe. But I'm pretty sure I didn't. I've always felt bad that I never like logged that moment because it does feel like big history. So there, by the way, we're in Azabe Kabar, the royal tombs, the torture tombs. I think that language is Persian. I gave you guys a lot of the cool weird easter eggs and stuff in the let's play of the personal story for this map. Like the graves and how they refer to the devs in New Crichton outside the front. And various other little uh, hints and tips. For the open world you do need to go in there as you saw. There's actually an event to do with opening and closing the gate in there. So sometimes you can sort of be locked out. But you could always just climb up. Here's the glass dome. This is where all the fire elementals would be underneath this. But you could always just climb up even at launch. And now... Uh, with uh, with mounts, you can do it even easier. So that's a little bit of a shame. Jump pads as well. Look at this second jump pad we're using. Look at that. And here we go. So this is the plaza. This takes us straight up to the final dungeon. And this is it, guys. This is going to be the end of the uh, the series, the promenade of the gods. You'll notice on the user interface, there's all these like little yellow men. These represent the temple statues. And you'll notice that they all have these gross green miasma around them. If we walk in range, we'll get various debuffs like healing less. And there's risen here. Back in the day, the idea was clear all the temples, all the temples would flip. This would be an easier place to assault then in that final meta event and therefore also open the entrance to the Greats of Arar. Cool events here as well. Another place where people would go for precursors. There you go. So that's map completion. Now here you can see we're actually collecting map completion right away. We've got that cool icon in the middle of the screen. For years, I love that icon. The only way to do it would be to go through all this effort. I've just given you guys 31 videos. Thank you so much for watching these. It's a lot of work to get it. And for a long time on my YouTube videos, when I was playing my Warrior, you could see I had the map completion icon there glowing and floating. Because you can only ever get it on one character. I thought it was kind of special. I liked it. I sort of wish I still had it. But there you go. So two gifts of exploration. I want to give a massive hearty thank you so much to TechZoon 
for helping me with the footage here. Really, if it wasn't for him collaborating with me and grabbing some of this, I would not have done this series. But I'm really happy, you know. This uh, this has been a great project. And if you guys enjoyed any of the commentary and stuff we talked about here, I do recommend you check out my personal story LP. That's the other half of the game. The half that this series didn't show. You know, in, in the personal story, I only get like 12% map comp. Well, this is 100%. Thank you, everyone. I feel really good. Eight years it's been, and I never properly showed you a map comp series. As far as I've done a good job chronicling Guild Wars 2, I now feel even more satisfied. So, let me know what you think. I don't have any plans right now to do the post-release maps. Maybe one day, but for now I have some other plans, which I'm really excited for you guys to see. So, keep an eye on the channel. As for what to do next, please also remember, I've got loads of useful links in the description. Including Discord, which I was talking to you guys a little bit about in some of those earlier episodes. And also, very importantly, the only way I'm able to make these series and continue trying to give you guys good Guild Wars 2 content is through funding on Patreon, which I'm really reliant on. You know, I'm not some big famous YouTuber that's got all the money in the world from ads and stuff i'm really really reliant on it and anyone that goes there genuinely makes a huge difference to my life so i really don't like talking about it but i figure at the end of a series if you guys enjoyed this and you want to support me in any way that is the place to go please do consider that i don't view it as a charity you do get cool perks in return including like early access to videos and stuff just maybe worth a peek and uh, until next time i hope you guys uh, had fun and i look forward to seeing you for more stuff Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.